Model selection works in a similar way to our other linear models that was normal based. So the R output has the standard error in one of the columns. And the Z value that essentially is the coefficient divided by the standard error and it then gives us a two-sided p-value to test the hypothesis that h0 being that the coefficient is equal to zero and h1 being the coefficient isn't equal to zero. So the property of the large sample property of the maximum likelihood is that as the sample size increases the maximum likelihood estimates are essentially unbiased. In other words, they are going to estimate what we're trying to estimate. We can obtain standard errors from there as well, and uh, they are in many ways more efficient and more precise. This is something we're not going to go into details of. But the other thing is that they are approximately normally distributed. So that means that beta j here, the coefficients of the generalized linear model, will have approximately a normal distribution. The mean is going to be the thing we're trying to estimate, the population coefficient, if you like, and the variable, the variance here is also going to be given as variance of beta j hat. And then we can obtain from there the usual hypothesis tests using z distribution. So under h naught, if beta j is zero, then it's simply going to be beta j hat divided by the standard error. Otherwise, we would have here the subtraction of beta j, but you see, because by hypothesis beta j is zero, that can be ignored, that doesn't have to be there. And the p-value is a two-sided p-value from the normal naught one distribution. So based on that, we can see that both age and the gender here are significant, and it shows us that as age increases, the log odds of survival decrease because of the negative coefficient and the females have a higher odds, log odds of survival than males. The only other thing that is left to investigate is an interaction effect. Is there an interaction effect? Now, that would mean that we're going to fit into the model not just the main effects of age and sex but interaction term which is indicated by the product of these things nothing else changes. So if I fix now an interaction term in the same way as we did before here, age with sex, or I could put all three variables together as age and sex in that way. We find here based on the normal distribution that the age-sex interaction is not significant. That's based on this so far. If I take a look at the model fit, you can look at this code afterwards. All we're doing is putting two lines over here, and as you can see in the commands over here, we're setting everything else up first. And we're going to plot the two lines here, which correspond to the survival probability of females and males, along with age, with interaction term in it as well. You can see the previous plot were parallel, because we didn't, in that case, fit any interaction terms. When you have interactions, it looks like while females actually have a higher survival probability for younger age, by the time you're past about sort of 42 or 3 or so, the males have a higher survival rate. That's interesting of how the model actually works. And that's really because these points here, being early here, pull down this curve quite fast. But as you can see here, most of the black ones over here uh, on the bottom line, so that line for the black or the main seems to be pretty flat and steady downward, no curve there. So Wall's test essentially is what we've been using so far, which is the normal distribution based test. If you use that, beta not equal beta three equal zero versus beta three not equal to zero, then it's going to have a normal distribution. We've got the output here. If you go back a second, you will find the output here gives me, this is the coefficient, this is the standard error. If I divide those two, I should get negative 1.71, and I can then find the two tail p-value from there with the normal distribution. So the calculations are done here. So probability that beta 3 is less than negative 
0.1616 but doubled because I've got essentially two-sided test and so the probability here is about 0 0.086 which means that based on this test there is no significant interaction between sex and age and so we should remove this from the model now if you look at the null distribution of beta 3, in other words, assuming beta 3 is 0, you'll find it's approximately normal here, as I have it over there, with mean 0 and the variance as estimated from the um, model fitting. And I can use those values to work out a 95% confidence interval for any of the parameters. The usual formula you had, we had, or the relationship we had was you take a look at the observed value of the particular parameter and it's 95 percent so it's 1.96 from the normal distribution then time is the standard error with a plus or minus in between so the coefficients can uh, we can calculate confidence intervals for each of the coefficients by hand and we've done it over there now remember this is a coefficient to find the log odds ratio will take this is going to be log odds ratio given in terms of the coefficient but if I want to actually go backwards and take a look at the odds ratio I would have to take the exponential of this so so far this coefficient here represents the log odds ratio to get the odds ratio I need to transform this back in terms of the exponential function so I take exponential of this which is my negative 0 0.078 plus or minus that number so I can take the expressions of these things and that transforms it back as an odds ratio and you can see the odds ratio here for beta 1 is between 0.86 to 0.99 almost close to 1 and I can do the same with beta 2 and the same with the uh, last coefficient so beta 2 again here the coefficient has the confidence interval as given and if I went to the odds ratio instead of the logs I was I take the expansion of that and I get here it's between 1.1 to about 21.869 so you'll notice of course while this is a symmetric interval based on the normal distribution this won't be symmetric because once I take the exponential function the exponential function tends to stretch out values of course being very much it grows very much faster so then you'll find this is won't be symmetric. So here I've got, as we said, sex has a significant effect, in, in, in effect and age has a significant effect. And if you look at the coefficient for the confidence interval for the interaction term, you'll find that at the 5% level we're saying that there is no significant interaction between sex and age. The other way of testing for models is what is called the drop-in deviance test. So we looked at, looked at the deviance earlier, and I'll go back and have a look at this in the next few slides. It compares two nested models. Nested meaning, for example, if you look at the interaction term here, you've got beta 3 was equal to 0 versus beta 3 is not equal to 0. So if I drop that, nesting means essentially I've got a model which contains beta 3. If I drop the, I've got a lower model, which essentially is a special case of this model where I've got beta 3 is equal, not equal, is equal to 0. So dropping beta 3 equals 0 gives me a smaller model. So the smaller model is nested within the larger model. In other words, the smaller model is a special case of the larger model. So we can do this in many ways. This is constrained model. So this here is with H not beta not beta three not equal, not equal to zero. Sorry, beta three not equal to zero here. That's the unconstrained model. And the constrained is when I actually have beta three equals zero. So the constrained model is this one where I've got beta three equals zero, which essentially means I'm looking at the model without interaction. And so I can compare all the variables here is equal to zero, it's not equal to zero, in one go. In fact, I'm comparing between two models over here. And so I can look at the deviance here. The deviance here represents essentially the discrepancy between the observed responses and the predicted by the fit model. It's similar to residuals, in fact, but not quite, not quite the same idea. And this it comes from the likelihood here. So if we look at the output of the model here, 
you'll find in the last part here two deviances. One is the null deviance, which essentially means that all the coefficients, except for the intercept, is equal, are equal to zero. And this is the residual deviance, which essentially corresponds to the model as fitted. And so the difference in these, you can see here, if I take a look at the residual deviance, the degrees of freedoms differ by three here. And that's because I've got one, two, or three extra variables in the fitted model as opposed to the null model, which only has the intercept. And the difference in deviance, essentially, if I fit nothing, just a constant, I get this as my deviance, null deviance, under the null hypothesis, everything is zero. The residual deviance here is going to be what I get when I fit the model. So I can look at the difference in deviances here between the null model and the fitted model, or the constrained versus unconstrained model. So the unconstrained model essentially is what I have fitted, fitted model, and the constraint is where I put everything to be zero, essentially. And so the difference in deviance is approximately chi-squared distributed, where the degrees of freedom here is the degrees of freedom the difference between the degrees of freedom between the constrained and the unconstrained model. So we look at the case of H0 versus H1 as beta 3 being equal to 0 and beta 3 not equal to 0. Then for the unconstrained model, that means when I have beta 3 not equal to 0, this is where I have the interaction term fitted. So this is with the interaction term. And, of course, larger models always will have a lower deviance. And the constrained model, where I've got no interaction term, 51.256, the difference is 3.91. And the degrees of freedom here will be just 1. Because I've got one extra term in this model with beta 3 not equal to 0. So if I look at the chi squared test for 1 degree of freedom for d bigger than 3.91, the p-value is 0.048. At the 5% level, I would then say that the model with the interaction term is better than the model without the interaction term. In other words, I'm going to reject the hypothesis that beta 3 is equal to 0, and I'll go for the unconstrained model where beta 3 is not equal to 0. And you can conduct that test very easily by essentially using this another command. This is the default. If you don't put chi squared there, it doesn't fit my default anyway. But you can see what it's telling me. It's telling me the two models there. And it's giving me, between the model 1 and the model 2, it's giving me the deviances. The degrees of freedom difference between those two models. And the difference between the deviance over here, in the end, also a p-value. So based on this, I would actually conclude that the interaction term is significant. Now, the thing with the drop-in deviance test is, it's slightly more accurate than using Wall's test because the Wall's test is based on using a normal distribution and the normal distribution isn't the best at least for smaller sample sizes. So you have to be careful over here as to how, what we do over here. So you find these both kinds of tests being used you need to understand how they're working. Now, as I was saying here, it requires a bit of care because the Wall's test, because it uses the normal distribution, assumes a symmetric likelihood function, the way we estimate the parameters. But instead, at least in the binary model and some other similar models, the likelihood is not symmetric. It's very highly skewed. It's very irregular. So we should be careful how we do this. In this case, using this deviance test, we will conclude that the sex age interaction is significant. And if you believe that the case, if you accept this model as being the better model, and if you remember back, we had a plot of the two lines of the survival probability of males and females with interaction. The females tended to survive with a higher probability for the lower age groups, but about past 43 or so, they had a lower survival probability. That's it for this week. We'll see you in the lectures. Thank you. Bye.